Welcome to the Freelancer podcast, where we talk about talent acquisition topics. I'm Eero, the co-founder of Freelancer, the platform where employers connect with freelance recruiters. Today we have Dom, and we will be talking about how to use psychology in recruitment. Welcome, Dom. Nice to meet you, Eero, and thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure uh, being with you today. So for the listeners, like we met with Tom like <laughs> a long time ago, I would say. Uh, like I remember that back then you were working uh, for a recruitment agency that was yeah. hiring in mainly I think in Netherlands. Yeah, mainly yes. Yeah, yeah, and then you were basically making a transition to do your own thing, and I think uh, we were able to like get you some clients in the beginning at least to uh, get your like new journey going. Exactly. As far as I believe, like the first time we spoke, you were at the start with Relancer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then we had like one introductory call just to. Uh, you were validating your idea, you were uh, like uh, receiving ideas and expanding your network. So I remember like being like quite happy for you at that point. And then around, I don't know, like four or five months later, uh, when we started with San, you were actually like uh, uh, both you and Relancer were one, one of the first to support us and not just with advisors, but uh, with bringing clients to our doors, uh, good ones, uh, nicely matched. So uh, yeah, now perhaps it's a it's a good moment to to share that that official like thank you for for all of your support. That's always uh, good to see, and I have, I also I looked into the site and I was like, oh, there's so many recruiters already, so you're quite big at the moment, like or or you have progressed quite nicely. So that's really nice to see that you are making the dream reality. Let's say in that way. Uh, but can you share a bit about your journey? Like, so, so you have background in psychology and then also I think in some kind of psychotherapy. What's the journey behind there? And then how, how did you end up in recruiting? You know the story, how everyone ends up in recruiting, right? <laughs> so, but uh, yes, so no, no, no one, I believe intentional is, uh, goes like into a recruitment uh, career. But uh, in my case, I feel that there is more to it. So uh, actually like, my interest in psychology started around, let's say, two or 2010, so before even university. The first book that I have ever like met in terms of psychology was a Psychology of Talent and Giftedness. So fast forward, I end up like learning from the people in the university who wrote that uh, specific book. And within university, especially like my interest was within organizational psychology, social. Uh, personality psychology and also psychometrics. So those were my area of, of, of interest of interest, and I was really eager to, to work within organizations. So that's how I saw myself. And then within the universities that was really active, had the chance to like work for various institutions and companies as part of internship. Uh, I also had the chance to be a co-founder of the first Macedonian Association of Psychology Students, which is, by the way, still active today. Greetings to my fellows at uh, CHESCO. And they are doing really good, really good, by the way. So that, that was a great opportunity to, to learn, try out like different industries and see whatever works best for me. So I remember working in, let's say, educational institutions, NGOs, uh, government institutions for uh, employability development skills for youth people. And once graduating, I had, uh, even like before graduating, I, I got my uh, first job. So I had the chance to, to choose between two options. One was within market research as a researcher. And then the, the other one was, was uh, as a talent acquisition specialist at international recruitment company. So you can guess what was my choice at the end. But then... Uh, luckily, and why I am happy uh, for for that decision is the following. So actually, like recruitment, it's uh, it's a really good gateway for uh, for organizational psychology. That's one. And then the second one, what I really really liked is that there's a lot of unexplored opportunities, unexplored area on where you can apply psychology within like specific in recruitment. I know that in selection. Uh, psychology is doing like excellent job in terms of uh, psychometrics and you know the interviewing stages and so on but in terms of recruitment not so much so that's where we see the the, the opportunity to to proceed innovate yeah definitely i think there is a lot of possibilities in there and in general like uh, i think unconsciously we we use a lot of psychology in, in many stages but 
but people yeah. maybe don't don't realize how, how they actually are using it like what i also noticed actually there is there is quite it's quite common at least what i have noticed is quite common to for recruiters to have some kind of psychology uh, background so it seems to be one of the ways like career choices after uh, learning and psychology because you can use it quite successfully in the recruitment field well yeah definitely the ones who are interested in organizational psychologists one of the options is starting uh, with recruitment and it's something that i would like normally advise since you get to be familiar with uh, broader things like organizational structures kind of how companies operate and especially if you're within agency setting then you get to learn from many different companies so that's a good start i also saw you that you're part of uh, like relaxify app what is it and what you're doing in, in relaxify app yeah, so Relaxify app started somewhere really close to the start of uh, Scient as well. Uh, it's an end-to-end well-being uh, platform and m- mobile application that actually supports companies to uh, to enhance the well-being of their employees. And how, how it's done, um, so it's actually like there are programs and gamified exercise that uh, boost their well-being across four dimensions, social, emotional, and physical well-being. And it's actually, let's say, more more focused on prevention, increasing awareness, but also it is supporting employees to build better well-being habits, so better mental health hygiene. Uh, it is not a substitute to professional support, so it's like psychotherapy and so on, but it's very good for prevention and for building habits. Uh, the mission is something that uh, really, really caught my attention at the start. And uh, the two co-founders, Jan and Alec, uh, actually like, reached out to me. We knew each other from before and decided like to, to support this idea since uh, it's a really great one and there is a lot of need for that. And uh, me, along with uh, the team of uh, psychologists we joined to make this uh, reality and uh, personally like I joined as a, as a co-founder so we are like still doing a lot of things with, Rel- with Relaxify and they are actually at the, at the moment and it's exciting times and a lot of new things will be will be happening there so if anyone is looking for a well-being solution for their organization feel free mm-hmm. to to explore relax i think well-being is something uh, that is super important but but not so much covered by companies for example we at freelancer we took a course on mental health and well-being mm-hmm. there is like organization in estonia and then we went uh, with our employees to to take part of that course helpful but but for example people working in talent acquisition like it's uh, known to have a high stress level and then yeah. so on so, so definitely having some initiatives or even others uh, like teaching people about mental health and how, how to like maintain uh, a good mental health uh, yeah. is super important so actually, like things are changing in a positive way now. As of January this year, I think that companies use uh, sustainability uh, policies. Now companies who have more than 500 employees are obliged to report what kind of activities they do uh, for in terms of uh, well-being at workplace. So it's great to see that uh, things are slowly beginning to go to go in a in a very good direction. And I believe it's just the start now. So of course, a lot of things have been done in the past, but I think that the need is rising as we as we speak. Yeah, yeah. I had a friend also who who wanted to do something uh, in that space, and then a few years ago he had like a really hard time because people understand why it's needed but but there is like a really hard to get buy in buy in from the company companies but if there is like these kinds of like uh, requirements that definitely helps a lot so yeah let's move forward about recruiting so so having some psychology knowledge is definitely helpful like uh, if you're in talent acquisition so maybe we, we can go uh, like step by step how, how we can improve like each recruitment step by a applying some principles in psychology. So, so maybe let's start uh, even before the actual recruitment, like how can psychology help us with identifying hiring needs? So in terms of, let's say, recruitment in like the overall process, there is like unlimited opportunities on what kind of theories you can apply. Of everything before that needs to be like tested, validated, and see if it works for the specific uh, needs of, of the company as well. I'm just like thinking about how to how to go forward without becoming very much abstract. I like the idea from starting from the from the needs uh, from the organizational needs steps since we can apply there several 
theories and concepts from uh, from organizational psychology for a start and also like personality one. There are several ways to do that, and I will stick more to some of the theories that I personally like to use since uh, due to the simplicity and, uh, and the effectiveness of those. But a uh, few things that we can do is first, psychology can help us to understand the team dynamics, the culture of the organization, and perhaps perhaps also to identify need for adding a new person with specific skill set in some areas. Uh, that can be done like in several ways. Uh, of course, the, the the first one is like uh, performance metrics and seeing where we need like improvement. If your strategy is to solve that with hiring, then that's a that's a starting point. Of course, this is like not only a psychological thing, but uh, also management uh, aspect. But psychology can really really help within within this job. And then the second would be identifying the so. In these steps, a lot of companies, what they're doing, they are performing psych psychometric assessment uh, on their team in order to assess the culture. And then based on that, they connect that with their uh, business goals and decide what kind of people they need in order to do that. So let's say, uh, and in this step, so easiest to use is the DISC methodology. I can share more about that as we go, but let's say if it's a startup company that uh, that needs to grow fast they need to be agile a lot they need to fail uh, to try and fail really fast we might be looking for more let's say innovative free take taker people who are really into action and so on so in terms of this we would be looking probably for influential and more dominant people and then if it's a company that's uh, let's say uh, already going to a scale up phase when they need let's say more more structure and more uh how to say more build processes then we can go with some people who are more conscious process driven detail oriented and so on so that's on the beginning when we start identifying the needs in terms of what kind of people we need and then what i would like like to use like uh, at any stage of the recruitment process are the a theories for needs and motivations. The most basic one with which I believe that everyone is familiar with or most are familiar with is the Maslow theory. So um I can actually I can actually take a moment like to 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 explain this one since if we want to mention like the next steps probably I will be referring to this theory a lot. So based on Maslow theory of needs and human needs are the ones, let's say, more most basic drivers that everyone, every person is striving for in order to have like a regular optimal level of well-being. So there are five levels of needs, starting with the most basic ones, uh, physiological needs. So those are the needs for uh, for uh, for food, for our sleep, you know, the, the physiological ones. And this can be translated within organizational setting as the, the bare minimum that a company needs in order to function. So what physiological needs are for an uh, individual human, for a company that would be, uh, I don't know, like enough cash flow to be able like to cover the expenses, to be able like to cover the salaries and the other operational needs. And then if we are hiring and the company has this um, challenge, then we need to find the people who, who, who will be suitable for solving such challenges. That's one, but also to know how to later in the communication stage, in the outreach stage, how to communicate this with the candidates so they already know what they are signing in for. So that's the first level of uh, of needs are the physiological needs. Then the second ones are the safety ones. The safety ones in terms of uh, in terms of organization may be, I don't know, like enough, let's say, legal protection, enough, let's say, uh, safety uh, processes and so on. And then if we are looking also to hire someone in this in this process, then we need what kind of people we need in order to to to, uh, to adjust these needs, and it's the same when we are looking for a candidate needs. So we'll go through an example after this, but let me just go through through all of them. Safety needs in, in terms of uh, in terms of people can be uh, regarding resources, personal security, having employment, uh, having uh, some some kind of property, so anything anything that keeps you safe. If you remember, before COVID. This was something that no one was looking on a job. Nobody Everyone cares. was looking to, <laughs> to more, let's say, advanced needs. But then after COVID and after yeah. the wars and the change in the market, few, the, the needs of the uh, candidates are more 
whether the, the, the job security is there, whether they will have a constant job, whether they would be able like to, to pay the bills and so on. So these are more basic needs. And actually this is one of the applications. So now we need, when we are reaching out to candidates that we address uh, this need, if it's already like uh, being um, covered by the company. And we had an example where we, adjusted the, the pitch of the company based on this, since we had a client who no matter like the COVID or the wars and so on, they decided not to let anyone behind. So they had zero layoffs. And this was a really good uh, selling point and was really important for the candidates hearing in this in this type of, let's say, unsecured times. So we covered the physiological needs and we call, covered the safety needs. The third layer is uh, the need for love and belonging. So in terms of, uh, let's say, individuals or candidates or people, those are the needs for friendship, intim intimacy, family, uh, beam, uh, and, and some sense of connection. In terms of work, that, put, that might be, let's say, feeling uh, part of the community, feel being identified with your uh, company on the job, and then having meaningful relationship with, uh, with your people. And then if that is something that the uh, culture offer, and if that is something that is already part of the needs of the specific candidate, we can focus our conversation on this one and addressing their needs and how they are covered within the, the position that we are, that we are uh, searching for. In terms of uh, organizational needs related to this level, there might be, let's say, good culture, good uh, team atmosphere, uh, good communication uh, uh, channels and practices. So those are some of the things that team are late. Sorry? Like team events, like so you can get yeah. together and then some other things like that. Yeah. Uh, something that the talent, the talent development team and uh, the, the people department is, is actually focused on. Then the next one, the, the fourth layer is the esteem and is related to respect, uh, self-esteem, to uh, status in, in most of the cases and so on. So in, in terms of job, here people are, are thinking about, let's say, things like, uh, do they get promotions? Are they have like a value job? Do they have an impact in their uh, role and so on? So that's on candidate side. In terms of uh, companies, if they are recognized on the in the marketplace, if they are perceived as a, as a big player or, or a key player, and if they are thinking about implementing such strategies, then we need like people who have the same drivers on the other side in order like to make that happen as well. And then the, the final level of needs are the self-actualization ones, when for people that would be like growing and fulfilling their potentials. And then for uh, organizations, the parallel will be reaching their uh, mission, uh, you know, innovating a lot, like going above and beyond, and perhaps uh, working already on topics like sustainability and things like that. So those are the, the five level uh, levels of, of needs. Uh, this is like based on the Maslow theories. There, there are like a few more that uh, are useful in this stage, but, but for the sake of simplicity, I will stick to this one. So when identifying hiring needs, I would personally uh, look for the organizational needs uh, that I just mentioned. And when speaking with hiring managers, I would like to hear what are their motivation, why, why they are hiring. If they are hiring someone, let's say senior director of business development, my question would be why you are hiring them. So if they are hiring them in order like to, to save the company and let's say avoid uh, layouts and costs, then we are talking about safety nets and, and physiological nets in terms of company level. But then if they are looking to uh, expand and be able like to invest and to beat their competition, because perhaps they are looking at the, at the value. This will change the approach, how we go, how we do things differently and how we communicate that with the clients. So for, for this, for this uh, stage, I covered like having psychometric uh, assessment in the beginning in order to see uh, hiring needs. Then uh, learning about the behavior organizational needs. And then the third one might be, and this is rarely practiced since it's expensive, but it's really good to develop internal criteria of, of success. So if you have, let's say, 100 employees and you are thinking, okay, what makes my sales department really successful? You can provide them with a wider psychological assessment and then develop norms based on that. 
of course it will have to be like tested changed over the time and you'll need to think about the, the dynamics and inclusivity but it's a very good start in order to define the right competencies that you will be checking later so uh i, I think that uh it's time to to move to the next uh phase right yeah it's it's super interesting i was also thinking uh how the of course there are specifics for uh, companies and people but in general how the market changed so it used to be that everybody w- wanted to uh, work in s- cool startups like mm. take risks and then and, and have like do something meaningful and, and then like the, the overall like the world uh, changed uh, and then the, the org- organizational pyramid uh, or the prior- priority what people wanted or needed changed like so it it went a lot and then still like the safety I, I think is very important and still involved uh, yeah. at at the moment and and and, uh, and uh, of course it makes sense because things are happening yeah. out there but also you mentioned a very cool aspect like uh, i know a, a very simplified version of it like if if you're building let's say you're building a company or startup or whatever and in the beginning you have you need builders so people like who uh, in a simplified example build the roof like the mm-hmm. roof doesn't have to be uh, perfect it has to work like and then at at some point of stage when the company grows and the product grows like you need people who will make sure that the roof doesn't fall in like so they are very different from the builders like who build the, or are like uh, we sometimes call them like uh, people who get things like started or, or starters like or, or whatever like that. so so they're very different and then you need to understand what kind of people you need, like uh, at which stage and then it can be very different also. Like I also I was thinking like if you say it like, okay, the company needs safety that they don't need to lay off people, but probably they need the opposite person like to take risks. So it's possible maybe like, uh, so it can be yeah. also very opposite what you need actually as a solution for that problem or whatever you need. Exactly. So. There's mainly like almost always like more solutions to one problem, of course. And that's why we are looking at team dynamics. So we do not want, usually do not recommend only having one type of people in an organization. In terms of what you shared, like, yeah, different theories can be applied in terms of uh, personalities. Uh, Bell being tested on team roles is also good for a startup since it yeah, identifies the key, the key roles that you need for a start. That's, that's also useful theory. Yeah. So we have a need, the company has a need. Uh, so basically, usually the ne- next uh, step is like you said, to talk with the hiring man, understand uh, what is the need behind it. And then you basically start creating like a job description, maybe doing a job ad. What can you share about uh, that steps of the process? Like? Yep. Yep. So in terms of um, the things that can be used in the, the job description. So first, like translating this and connecting it with the personality type if we already, or types if you have them identified already. So if we are thinking, uh, t- talking about the disk theory in the specific case for uh, where companies looking business development uh, director in order to get the team on board to shake things a bit around and to uh, help them be uh, a bit better performance. We might be looking for for someone who is uh, both dominant and influential type. And then in that case, we can use such uh, wording and uh, the, the words for, for combination of those two, two profiles can be related to actions, to people, to taking charge, to innovation, communication, and so on. And then we can add that kind of word that really resonates to them and it's related to, to their needs as well. Then also uh, we can, and that is in terms of, let's say, language side. Since uh, there is theory that we tend like to, to recognize or spot more things that are more similar to us. And that's why we are using uh, this kind of theory. While we are at the, at the language phase, now this is also like important to, to, use, to use like inclusive language. So there are actually like several good, cool, um, cool tools that you can use in order to equalize the number of uh, feminine versus ma- masculine words, and also like to to add some inclusive words as well. I'm not sure if I remember the name of that tool right away, but I can I can share it. So this is one one cool point where you can start. I will speak now regarding since in writing job descriptions uh, next to next to the needs there are like few things that you need to be aware of and coming more from the perception and memory side and attention side so in terms of me- memories usually like people mostly memorize the first the, the beginnings and the end of things 
So make sure to, to use that uh, appropriately and, and then perhaps use the first sentence to, to really summarize what the role is about, what the company is about, and allowing someone to understand everyone with, a, with a just like one or two sentences. Then in terms of uh, allowing the candidates to, to be able like, to, to go through the job description in details, use chunking. Chunking means like information that can be processed in different paragraphs, uh, everything to be like organized to, to make sense, but then not to have a huge paragraph of, of text. And then related to this one is the cognitive overload bias. So do not try to do like a lot of things in the job description. Share the most important things, share things regarding the role. So they need to, to, to have like a good uh, amount of alignment with what is expect, expected. Then the second thing would be explain the culture. Here you can here you can share like the the things from the Maslow theory of, uh, theory of needs. So you can share what of the what kind of the benefits of the company is actually uh, is is addressing. Then in terms of people with specific title, let's say uh, with specific type, for example, let's say this theory and let's take the dominant influential uh, type of person. So we here we can use like uh, the need for freedom. We can address the, the autonomy that the role will have, the, the impact that the role will have, the power like to implement things and things like that, to drive things forward, th this will help them. Also, there is, by the way, really, really useful thing, tool for this one. If you know already like the type of people that you want to attract, Crystal knows it's a good tool that can help you with that. So it's actually a tool that uh, helps you to to write a text uh, applicable for a specific type. And also it tells you what kind of sentences you need to write. For example, for one time you need like more details and focus more on the culture and the, like uh, the harmony. For another type, it will be like straightforward information, keep it short, no bullshit. In terms of, let's say more conscientious type, they know they want to have like all the details. So knowing the organization, you can use this tool. It's the shortest way to, to start applying something and then adjust the, the, the job description from there. Yeah. Actually, I never like written a job description from this angle. I have done it in reach outs. Like, and, and it's super easy to do uh, if you know the person quite well. So you know where to push and then what to emphasize and then so on. Like, and then of course, like in general, like, we we usually use a template or or the logic from this book like a method of hiring has a good, really good but but not specifically like this so this probably can give you really good results on uh, getting people who you who match the like the profile that you're actually looking for interesting sounds super super good way to do it so what about sourcing? What are the, some psychology back tips uh, for sourcers? Yeah. Like, so, so we have a job description. We know who we're looking for now. Now we need to start, like, of course you can do job ads, whatever you can ask for recommendations, but if you, let's say you start to look for, from them, for yeah, them. So this one is actually like the, the hardest step to, to, uh, to apply uh, something since you have like really limited information for them. You just like mm -hmm. here and we are talking just about sourcing. So not yet an outreach, right? So you have. LinkedIn, uh, you have some description that they have written, may, might not, might be just like copy pasted from someone else, especially today with uh, ChatGPT writing most of the descriptions, right? So it's becoming more and more tricky to, to use something here. However, I do have some, um, so, some guidance on this one and something that we also are practicing uh, internally. And I would like to mention, so here in terms of this, I would not recommend uh, selecting people based on the hypothesis that you will have. You need to remember that at this stage, we only have hypotheses of candidates and it will help us just, let's say, to prioritize who to reach out first. So that's that's the note that I would like to, to add on this step. So but what do you mean by uh, you wouldn't use the hypothesis that you have? So you would expand the search or, or what does it mean? Yeah, let's say that uh, that we are looking as as the same example that we shared, like senior business development director, right? And we already know that we are looking for someone who is ideally more dominant and influential. The reason why those two, because it's uh, let's say smaller companies, so they are still not heavy on managing enormous teams and so on. So they do not do not meet some process oriented. 
going back to, uh, to the conversation, we, we are looking for someone who is more dominant and influential based on the, this theory. And then uh, it's more of a headhunting approach. There are 500 candidates out there within the market that we are looking for, looking like they they're fit the criteria, right? And then we have only capacity for to reach out limited number of candidates. And we, it, it is in our interest to prioritize who to reach out first so we can close the position faster with less efforts, right? So while sourcing, what we can do is the ones who we feel that, that match this personality type, and I will share how, how, how that can be done. Uh, we put attack on them when adding uh, to, uh, to our ATS or CR. So we actually like put attack, let's say dominant and, and A. And this is just a hypothesis from our end. But it will be tested when we see the re reply rates after that, and we have the screening calls, and then we can actually like double check. So in, in this scenario, there are like uh, 500 can, can candidates available. While sourcing, will keep the regular approach, but then deciding who to uh, be reached out first, I would look for the ones who have more signs of having, having dominant or influential personality and that how that can be done like there are several ways we can look at their interests it's a usual good indication of what they are following what kind of information they 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 uh, are interested in the second one it can be the wording for example more dominant people have more straightforward language sometimes they do not even like include a really long description and they speak about achieving results about power status leaderships uh directing people managing people and so on if we are looking for influential then we are looking for someone who speaks a lot about let's say ideas networking communication and things like that they are using words like inspire motivate dynamic enthusiastic and so on so what we do in these steps is actual making a hypothesis of which candidate can be uh, better for us and we prioritize the, the outreach for them and that's everything that i will suggest doing not going into like too much unneeded theories so this is good for a start and then in the outreach we can use the the, the hypothesis of the person in order to adjust the 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 uh, message according okay we oh, have good. tested this as well we needed like to to play along to go like back and forward there are some differences if the job description requires one type and then you're attracting different times that can be a bit tri tricky but in general if everything is aligned it tends to improve both the response rates and after that the conversion rates as well of course it will need to be tested and there are plenty of factors that relate to response rates and uh, this one but if you have like experimental group and uh, just like uh, one where you try this approach you can test the difference so so we we are basically at the uh, reach out so of course we do the sourcing we, we do reach mm -hmm. outs uh, but maybe maybe we can cover also like the gen general ideas in communication in overall because there's a lot, quite lot, a lot of communication in the way yeah yeah so in terms of outreach, I just like share that. So we actually adjust the, the message in order to, to uh, address the, the personality type that we assume that that person is. We will actually check. We can actually like check it to some level during screen calls, but at this level, it is served just to increase our chances. And that's it, you know? And this is in the outreach from this perspective. In terms of uh, what else we can use. So there is something about, let's say, uh, called as a implicit egotism theory, which tells that people like prefer to have things and to respond faster to things that really address to them, like their name, mentioning their name. The, we have done like that, like mentioning the the name two times at the beginning, at the end, along with the along with the call for action. Some mentioning of their like experience that have been like interesting for them if they've joined some event or something like that, and. Uh, that increases uh, responses rate. And here actually comes the, the, the part of actually of uh, personalization. So if you need like to outreach to a la larger amount of, of people, I would say the ones that you have shortlisted to, to be aligned with your type, do a personalized outreach for them and the rest, okay, you can do a semi-personalized with templates and so on, if it's needed. Um, something else that here can be used there are like behavioral economics principles that I would not recommend and would not share since can be misused a lot. Also like keep it short. They have few seconds attention span. 
We do not want to, uh, to overload them with information. So also using the chunks, also using the end and the beginning as a memorizing part. And people can remember six, six to seven things at a time. So keeping short and aligned. But like you mentioned, uh, I think if you have a theory and you want, let's say, somebody who is more dominant, and then you, you do this personalized reach out. If they really are, then the response rate de definitely is uh, going to be higher. If they're not, like, uh, then it's going to be probably maybe lower because it's going to gonna be something that they don't like. But in the end, like, if you want that dominant person, it, it doesn't matter probably. Uh, and for the other, you use more general, like, you don't go with this tone of voice, like, so I would call it tone of voice like, that you would use. Like, yeah. and, and, and for then... them, more aligned to, to what the job description type is. And then the hypothesis is that you will attract that the people who resonate with those values as well yeah yeah but as i said like more factors play uh play role here so you'll need to test and play with things until you find your your way so now we're getting to the point that you said is very well covered in recruitment so so we are like picking the candidates to move forward, like pre-screening, interviewing, um, maybe testing, like uh, what can be done here. In terms of screening, you will, you would like to share something regarding that or the so, selection assessment part? Yeah, I can give you an example. Like, so, so how I do uh, uh, pre-screening, I don't use any test or something like, so my pre-screening, like usually is like I have candidates, I have like a 30 minute call, sometimes it's longer, it depends. Like I try to understand uh, how, how the, uh, the person works, like what is like uh, who they are or what is their personality or, or so I, I understand how they work like, and then I can understand what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, uh, make decisions. Okay. Are these weaknesses a problem for me? O of course, it's like in based on so short uh, call. So it, the hypothesis there can be wrong like but but it gives me an overview like and then when i go to the next step usually it's more about testing so testing i can see what they actually do i already have their uh, what they have done before like as a cv or whatever like and then i understand i try to understand who who is the person then i want to see what they can actually do so i give them a home task so then they will have an interview or like a meeting with other people who they will work with so, so to see like if they also match like usually if i don't do the pre-screening there might be some like culture lasting uh, yeah. or would take part of the interview like but but my pre-screening basically to understand how that person works and that's but that's in a way maybe psychological behavior like on the person like who the person is how the person thinks like yeah. very good approach i believe like super effective the one that you are already using uh, of course those are limited usually around 20 30 minutes calls right yeah, yeah. so uh of course if, if we would be able like to, to check everything during that step there wouldn't be a need for for further four step process right so in terms of that, like few things judging on, on, uh, on my side there, and especially in agency, it's great that uh, since you have the room to do to that in the agency side, learning a bit more regarding the person. So my idea is not uh, like to, to sell the, the role, but to meet that person, you know, and then uh, interest comes as only as a result. So few things there, first understanding their needs and to see how they're matched with the organizational ones and uh, the ones that they're specific that the role that is specifically open. The good thing about agencies, if we see that misalignment here, we can offer them something else and the trust with the candidate is uh, on a higher level at, at, the, at the initial start as well. Then after we do that, we can also like briefly check some of the uh, like main co competencies that uh, are being asked for. And uh, here I use the, the re reciprocity norm. So actually providing with a lot of information as much as possible so they can, after that, share as well, being open. Well, screening, it's always important. Uh, if we want to have, let's say, more sensitive questions, if we have for the screening call, a salary is for some of people, though, how much they're earning right now. Uh, it might be re the exact reason why they are looking for a change. For some people, that's more sensitive. And if we start the, in, uh, the initial conversation with that, they tend to, hide it or just like provide us with answer that can just satisfy us and that's where the biases are but then uh, from qualitative research practices it is always good to start with wider questions with more safe i would say and then as you go deeper in the conversation and you slowly begin to to build trust then to go to the ones who are more significant and that will increase your your success as well in terms of this 
course, a lot of things can be used, like any psychology theories can be used in this one uh, from psychotherapy. Transactional analysis give you a lot of uh, handy tools, how to see behavior. But for recruiters, I, w- I think that these ones that we mentioned would be would be enough. And, and usually, like, it depends on the company, but but usually the process is quite long. And actually, my, my wife is at the moment... Uh, in, in the uh, new job search and I can mm. see like how the actions of the company demotivate like if they do something like in the process or something is unclear or whatever like how the motivation goes down and then when they do something great uh, then how the motivation raises so it's it's super interesting to see at the moment uh, from the side like how it it is happening but but what what like com- companies can do to motivate candidates and keep them in, in, engaged in in the hopefully short hiring process but usually slow yeah yeah so i would say like from from the from recruiter side the companies can of course like optimize their hiring uh, process based on based on feedback and we do not need to extend that topic a, a, a lot but in terms of what the recruiter can do uh, build trust with the candidates and stick to that. Trust has five phases. One of them is being transparent. The other one is actually like delivering what you said that you will deliver. So provide feedback on time, coach them, help them, show them that you also care for them. And then explain if there is a need for, need for waiting. Don't just like uh, keep them hanging. A very good way to remove some of the negative experiences is by really explaining that the process really well at the at the start so that's why in screening calls we need to to share what how the process will look like how long it will uh it will uh be and so on so those are the some of the things and then like provide them with constant feedback keep them engaged and address any concerns that they have as they go. So these here are actually the, the needs that we that we mentioned at the beginning. The the muscle tier here are important and especially in offer acceptance state. They would like to be sure that actually if they are looking for a change because of I don't know their need for status improvement that that will actually help them. That they will have the autonomy in their in their position that they will have let's say the team that the company have promised uh, to, to them to, to lead so things like that in terms of salary so in terms of offering what recruiter can do is ensuring that everything that has been communicated in the pre in the initial stages that are actually being included in the offer if n- there's no possibility for that at least make plans how those can be addressed in the future so here it uh, goes in the, let's say, that risk avoidant this part of the decision making when we want to make sure that everything that scares them off from the offer is actually being addressed. Of course, in an ethical manner. So what are the five uh, stages of building trust? Yes. So they are not actually stages. There are more domains, I would say. Uh, so those are su- sub-dimensions of what is actually trust being like consisted of. And that's one of our also like core values as well. So one would be benevolence. It's actually like uh, showing that uh, you're caring for the best interest of the candidate. And that is like usually like being uh, sent during the conversation. Second one is re- reliability. So if we say that we follow up with them in two days, let's let it be two days. If we say that uh, we will do something for them, we really need to do that in order to, to build the trust if not we just put ourselves in a trap and we are losing the the, the trust in the really early stages um, the, the other one is competence so actually radiating that we can do what we are promised to do we can of course be willing to do it but they cannot trust us if they know that we wouldn't be like competent for that part third one uh, the, the fourth one would be more let's say summarized as honesty and like uh, having like a full transparency with them. So if you see that some aspects of the job might be a potential deal breaker for them or might not be really aligned with the, what their expectations are, it's better that we communicate than they're finding it out. That way they will have the time like to think about it. They will perhaps ask your help for any guidance how they can like overcome that or negotiate that part as well. And the last one is openness, which is like related to the previous one. It's also being ready to 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 build a good con- communication with them, like being also as they are exposed. So when it comes to selecting the final candidates, like uh, there is like a 
big part on, on the decision maker psychology. How common is bias? You already mentioned it before and how to overcome this unconscious bias that it has. Yeah, so like, I don't think that we can fully avoid it, to be honest. One is psychometric assessment, standardized one. If they are standardized, that means that they have been like proven to be reliable, which means that if repeated, similar results will be uh, gathered. And then valid, which means that they're actually measuring what they that they say that they are measuring. Having the exact same process for every candidate help you like remove some of those biases and then look look at their competences on more objective level. And then use a further step, like a final interview after that, to conduct behavioral or uh, competency-based questions. And here you can actually like train your employees and hiring managers on how to, let's say, specific, uh, be aware of specific biases and how to actually evaluate if some of the competences are met or not. There are like several biases that can occur at any given point to any of us. Whatever is your level of, of uh, I don't know, like seniority of experience, this happens all the time. And we just need to be humble enough to know that we are at the risk of doing such, such errors. Uh, the first one is confirmation uh, bias which is actually if we believe that uh, we want to see something on the candidate, then we actually are biased to, uh, to see that even it's not there. <laughs> and that comes like, uh, this is really common in recruiters as we really want that candidate to be like the, the unique and the one that we are looking mm -hmm. for. And uh, we are start to assign something that is not, that is not there. The second one is a uh, halo effect. Halo effect, what it makes is if the candidate is really good at one part, we tend to evaluate their other aspects as also being above average. And this is also a bias. Mm -hmm. So what we can do here is just like having the, the competences well-defined for a specific role and rate them separately and then uh, combine everything. The one opposite to this one is the horn effect. Let's say the, the person had like really good uh, impression for a specific uh, question. And then we tend to see the other uh, things that uh, they share, like also evaluating more negatively. And that's why we also need like to, to have this, let's say, scoring system more, more objective and with some, let's say, KPI, some ob objective norms of, of how to value that. A similarity attraction, it is more likely that I would like candidates similar to me and you perhaps will like candidates more similar to you. And this is a bias and that's why in selection process it's good to have more more interviewers. So no, not just one. But what we're trying like with, uh, with a company that uh, hasn't so much established process right now, we try to include two interviewers at, at a time who are also valid, relatable for the role and uh, bring more to the uh, candidate experience. Yeah. Anchoring. Uh, effect is the first impression. So the importance of the first impressions. I might have like excellent first impression and not be so so great candidate. And because of that, I might have advantage to some candidate that had like connectivity issues or had really bad day at the at the start and uh, it's already skewed. So those are the biases. And uh, in order like to overcome that psychological assessments, adding them in the selection step, and competence-based questions. What we have also done is, I don't remember if it was in the book, uh, but but when we have different interviews or people who talk, we don't share the notes with each other. So there is no yep. like, I don't know if it's so anchoring that if I so see somebody else's like opinion on the person, it will affect me like uh, on that side. But but what I what I have seen mainly is I, I think two things that can one happen that that we hire somebody who is similar to us, which is super bad actually, because uh, in the organizations, it's good if you have different people uh, complementing each other. Like, so somebody is uh, better at something and then some, uh, somebody else is better at something else. And in the end, like in a team, they basically mm. complete each other. And the other way is probably that you hire somebody that is uh, different uh, to yourself. Like, and that, that is actually good. Depends on the role. Maybe sometimes it's good to have somebody uh, similar. So, so I think these are like two things that usually maybe happens like and that uh, you 
hire somebody and on the psychology part there is a, another interesting part like if you hire somebody who's similar to you you will be super annoyed about the flaws they have like because they, they will have the same things that you're it's a mirror to yourself and then you're angry mm. at them they actually are angry at yourself like so that's what's going to happen if you hire somebody who is similar yeah. to yourself. So there's going to be honeymoon in the beginning. It's all, oh, it's so good. It's so cool. Like, I love you. <laughs> you're like me. And in the end, they're like, I hate you. are like, you do these dumb things, like, but, but you're the same basically. So, so yeah. these kinds yeah. of things can happen. So. Yes. This, these things can happen. Like it's not necessarily the case, but can definitely happen. Uh, like using the, the, the disc theory, one company wanted like to have more dominant people. So more action oriented or, uh, uh, once like credit to to achieve results and then hire too many of those and then yeah, the yeah. culture went down and they will fight over dominance so you need to have yeah, really yeah, good yeah. balance yeah. at least like three three supporters for one dominant person I would say. yeah I, I think that's that's super uh, important thing to know uh, also in the in the team environment that there isn't room at least in one the same team like for a lot of similar people because they will start to compete like if they're dominant for example i i have had that like in the early days it can happen for with co-founders for example if there's two mm -hmm. people like like two heads on the dragon they're they're pushing in, in separate ways and these kinds of like uh, things can happen so that's definitely something that can be considered when putting together teams like, and of course definitely. hiring new people to teams how these people will yeah. work together definitely. I do have I do have one one uh, that I can share with you regarding team roles actually the one that we are using in terms of psychometric assessment so there are like several that, that are really good uh, perhaps big five and uh, these are the most widely used but uh, Hogan's personality assessments are being like recognized as uh, ones with really good reliability and validity a predictive index they also have cool uh, really good uh, assessments. And they actually introduce something called talent optimization, a super useful tool. For anyone who is within those topics, I would suggest they take a look at their uh, talent optimization programs uh, and how they solve that with, uh, with software and uh, knowledge support as well. And my and our perhaps personal favorite, it's uh, the assessment of SciTech, SciTech International. They are within assessment for more than 20 years and we, we we get in touch like uh, thanks to our partners of Elite Academy in the Balkans and Italy. And it's a very comprehensive assessment that has really good uh, reputation and uh, precision. And I can share, they also cover like a lot of things, uh, but I can share a topic regarding the, a slide regarding how the results in terms of what you just mentioned, um, the team roles. Yeah. So these are like a one page of 20 page report. And uh, this uh, report actually is related to the to the Belbin's uh, team roles. And here you can see a more than eight different team roles um, that there are identified within a team. And then what we are looking like to, to see when we, we build a team to have like a compatible characteristic. For example, my dominant ones are Co coordinator the first one and then resource investigator and then the third one is a uh, team builder and then uh, my co-founder actually is more on the uh, inspector completer while also having some uh, resource investigator uh, uh, things like that. at one point we really needed uh, someone who to, to shake things up you know shape or driver and we actually had a strategic hire since we became more, let's say, avoiding a risk and avoiding charge and things like that. And this can be like super helpful when uh, when building your initial team. Yeah, we we also like I think I have taken the the big five uh, test uh, and then also like I have uh, used this uh, sixteen personalities. It is it's in a way it's quite accurate. Of course, usually there is something off, but in general, like you get quite good idea of of yourself and also uh, like uh, if you do it with uh, some of the people like you can get the understanding of uh, who they are like and it doesn't take too much yeah. time like so it actually for 16 personalities it's not recommended to be used for recruiting but more for team building activities 
to get yeah, yeah. to to know each other uh, yeah. yeah and in terms of hiring it hasn't doesn't have like really good predictability scores yeah i haven't used it for recruiting but in general to understand like how to maybe uh, work with somebody you collaborate so we did it with the founders like when we started freelancer like i haven't used it for, for building the team but that was super crucial and uh, we we tried to do as much as we can to understand will it work in the long term so i think you already covered but maybe we can go over again like so how can recruiters achieve a higher offer acceptance rate like uh, you mentioned some of the things earlier can we maybe go over them and then if you want to add anything else like uh, on top of that so in th- in terms of uh, accepting offer offers i think that i covered that previously so actually like making sure that everything that has been like communicated previously as concerns or as needs of the candidate that you make sure that these are addressed also coaching the had the hiring managers to to craft a special one and bringing them the position of the candidate but being transparent both with them on what are the pros and cons uh, of uh, having such employees so they can drop the good onboarding uh, plan for them or let's say after that like a management plan for them plenty of things can be used uh, we do not definitely want to use dark psychology here for uh, influencing decisions candidate accepting a job is much important for them than it's for us as recruiters or as as for the company for them it's like a big chunk of their life and it's like super unethical to to do this that's why I'm not sharing those ones during our call, since uh, it can be misused. In sales, I see, like, even in, like, behavioral behavioral economics and in marketing, they have been used. And some of them are already started to be, like, regulated or, for, or forbidden. Mm-hmm. In recruitment, uh, it's good that not, not much of that is being uh, used. <laughs> Like, I know there are books about social engineering, so basically influencing yeah. people. Of course, it can be probably like a sword, uh, like a knife with double edge, because of mm-hmm. course, maybe you can influence somebody to accept, but if they like quit in uh, in the next three months or whatever, then it's not good for you. Like, so, so in that, sure. it can be yeah. maybe risky. It's a lose, lose, lose situation on the long term. So the company loses, you lose in terms of your credibility and the candidate. I think is the most. It's something that like really, really not ethical, and uh, especially like mm-hmm. psychologists, we we are trained in terms of ethics. So yeah, yeah. Do so. yeah, I understand that. Uh, like, if you would be only thinking of acceptance rates as one metric, and you want to improve it, then you're like, okay, let's do this. This is gonna improve it, but but it's gonna affect some other metrics, and then that's gonna be bad. So you have to see the bigger picture. So. That's yeah. good. So, yeah. so That's... don't use social engineering. <laughs> so uh, let's move uh, to the maybe the last stage. Of course, like recruitment is done. Like uh, the candidate accepted the offer. Like so, the onboarding starts. What on the psychological aspect uh, employers need to like achieve so 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 the candidates would succeed? Like what you have to make them feel uh, or what's important. So here, like plenty of things can be done, of course, depending on uh, which approach do you do, do you have and what is like most important for them. I would say uh, start with uh, creating a positive first impression with the primary effect. So making sure to have the, the first day organized and have them organized to address all of the needs that we discussed uh, first. So getting them with the basics of the office or the organization of if it's like virtual, give them a guide there. Then second, get them to know where, who they can reach out for their specific, let's say, inquiries that they might have. Then meet them with most of the people, meet them especially with the people who are a good example uh, of behavior within your company as well. And then sh- share them a lot, share with them a lot regarding your your, your culture and, and the long-term vision of the company, since those are like initial experiences of the candidate and are usually stronger to what's, what's to come. Allow them to have some uh, flexibility, in autonomy in terms of how they would like to approach the onboarding, so not super, super structured. It will... Um, it will help them with their autonomy needs. And then in terms of cognitive uh, overload, uh, don't try to, to, to share everything within two days since they will most likely forgot uh, the, the, some crucial aspects and then will be asking you to do it again. Try to organize it in more, let's say, digestible chunks. Uh, the third one that can be done, it is by a theory of expectations. It's like clear, define the clear things they need to do 
especially in the beginning. So provide clarity on the, let's say, like job expectations. If there are any KPIs, share them. Uh, this is the right things to, this is the right time to do that. Like remove uh, as much as possible fast within the process as, as you can. Yeah. It is also like good to, to, to make this for them like quite achievable. So if you can organize the onboarding in order so they can have some quick wins, this will this will help them like to feel confident that they will actually be successful in this step and and actually onboard a, a bit faster. Why well, I asked the question was like I have seen some companies who have quite low like they say 30% of our employees go through our probation period because our expectations are so high like but I was thinking like maybe your onboarding is so bad uh, because <laughs> people are good but you just can't like uh, get get them going it can yeah. be either way like you know, the expectation maybe are really so high but if you have like a bad onboarding like then people either quit or or like they will not might not be uh, successful and they might be like uh, demotivated or, or don't have the confidence and, and so on so it's it's definitely crucial and so it, it doesn't stop from the hiring like you, you have to get it uh, you have to get them going, yeah. going. You know, like even if you get like an A player, the best one, and then you put them really un unoptimized for success, so they are not set for, for success right from the beginning, then it will cost you a lot as a company. And then certainly it will cost the candidate as well. So I think it's time to wrap up for, from here. So that's it for episode five of Freelancer Podcast. Uh, if you like this episode, feel free to subscribe and share it. And uh, thank you for tuning in. And I hope to see you in the next one. Thank you for the invitation, Nero. Cheers.